Hello, this is one of the few videos that I'm making uh, on bacteriology and parasitology. So this one is about bacterial pathogenesis. Let's get to it. So let's look at the definitions. Pathogen organism capable of causing disease. Virulence is a quantitative measure of pathogenicity. LD50 or lethal dose 50 is a number of organisms needed to kill half the host. ID50 or infectious dose 50 is a number of organisms needed to cause infection in half the host. So, obligate intracellular organisms are the ones that can grow only within the cell, within the host cell, and facultative bugs can grow within, outside, or on the bacteriological media. So let's look at three very important definitions that we should know. Epidemic, number one. It occurs frequently than usual, so any disease infection that occurs frequently than usual is epidemic. Uh, pandemic has word, in, disease or infection with worldwide distribution. Endemic, constantly present, but at low levels in a specific population. Colonization, very important definition, very important concept. So um, basically it refers to the presence of a new organism that is neither the member of normal flora, nor is it cause of the symptoms. So what the heck is infection? It's simply entrance of organism into the body. That means that if the organism has entered your body, you are infected. Okay, so why people get infectious diseases? Uh, it is because the homeostasis between the organism and the host defenses is disturbed. Uh, that means that uh, basically the bug or whatever is uh, causing disease becomes more stronger than your immune system and so you get sick and two determinants in overpowering host. One is number of organisms infecting and causing disease and two is virulence of these organisms. And again virulence is determined by organisms ability to produce various virulence factors. Uh, and as we all know two main arms of host defenses. Uh, one is innate and second one is acquired immunity. And acquired is further subdivided into antibody mediated and cell mediated immunity. Um, reasons, there are reasons for reduction in the function of host defenses, obviously. And so four of them listed here, genetic immunodeficiencies being number one. An example is a gamma globulinemia. Second one is acquired immunodeficiencies uh, and AIDS, diabetes are examples. Third one is autoimmune disease, any autoimmune disease like I think rheumatoid arthritis is one, unsure. And fourth one is cancer patients receiving chemo. Now let's talk seven stages of pathogenesis. Uh, they are listed here, you can read them. Transmission, evasion, adherence to mucous membrane, colonization, disease symptoms caused by toxin production and inflammation, host response, progression and resolution of a disease. These are seven stages. We're going to talk more about them as we progress. Transmission is the passage of disease. Um, and so understanding the chain of transmission is very important because it helps in prevention of that disease. Uh, and there are a few routes of transmission. First one, very common one really, uh, is human to human. And it, it includes, uh, like, you know, examples are uh, uh, pathogens that spread through respiratory droplets, uh, through blood transfusions. And the second one is non-human. Trans, uh, transmission, so that would include, uh, say, uh, tick bites uh, or insect bites. Uh, and then there's fomites. Fomites are uh, inanimate objects that serve as a source of uh, bacteria. So they also help in uh, transmission. So remember, there are two important uh, types of transmissions. One is vertical and second one is horizontal. And vertical transmission me means uh, transfer of organism from a mother to fetus, so usually during pregnancy, uh, or you know a baby who's feeding on mother's milk. Uh, um, horizontal transmission includes person-to-person -person transmission, so that's a usual case scenario. Uh, all right, so there are four important portals of entry. Uh, Obviously, you guessed it right, GIT, GU, genital urinary, uh, respiratory, and skin. Mucosal adherence is also important, so let's get to it. Pili, glycocalysis, and capsules 
uh, allow adheres to cell surface. Uh, adhesins are the molecules that mediate adherence to cell surface. So, uh, examples, uh, biofilms and curly proteins. Biofilms usually form uh, after attaching and attach after after the attachment and they uh, especially uh, like to form on foreign bodies like prostatic joints heart valves and so they protect bacteria from both antibiotics and host immune defenses uh, plus they also retard the wound healing so you know uh, biofilms are pretty virulent um, curly proteins on the other hand for example in e coli and salmonella mediate bacterial binding to endothelium and extracellular proteins so this is all about adherence uh, if if a certain strain of bacteria does not have this uh, property uh, they most probably will not cause any disease so they'll be non-pathogenic so it's an important vir virulence factor finally how the bacteria causes disease uh, three main primary mechanisms of action in, number one is invasion and inflammation. Number two is toxin production. And number three is immunopathogenesis. Invasion and inflammation, like uh, the usual adherence to the mucous membrane and then cause inflammation from there. Toxin production, endotoxins, exotoxins. Uh, so those are responsible for disease symptoms. And the final one, immunopathogenesis. Immunopathogenesis means that it's usually not the bug or bacteria itself that causes disease and its symptoms, but the immune response to the bacteria or pathogen that causes the symptoms. So, interesting stuff, eh? Okay, so we're going to divide invasion and inflammation in two parts, and we're going to talk first about invasion. Several important enzymes are responsible for invasion. Uh, first one, collagenase and hyaluronidases. They allow bacteria to spread uh, through the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, then there's coagulase, which accelerates fibrin clot formation, which uh, uh, protects the bacteria from phagocytosis by walling off around it. Um, IgA protease degrades IgA, which allows the bacteria to adhere to the mucous membranes. Leukocytes can destroy both neutrophilic leukos, uh, that's leukocytes, and mono, uh, sorry, macros, that's macrophages. Um, and then there are several other virulence factors, and, um, like antiphagocytic factors, um, and these are these include capsule, uh, which is usually external to the cell wall and prevents uh, phages from adhering to the bacteria. Uh, of course, anti-capsular antibodies allow uh, more effective phagocytosis. This process is called opsonization. Then there's cell wall proteins of gram-positive cocci, for example, M protein of group A strep and uh, A protein of Staph aureus. Uh, the M protein is antiphagocytic and A protein binds to IgG and prevents uh, complement activation. So let's dig deeper in this concept of invasion. Bacterial invasion depends on bacterial surface proteins called invasins and specific cellular receptors from integral family of transmembrane adhesin proteins. Just remember specific cellular receptors, all right? Um, so actin microfilaments move bacteria into the cell and then inside bacteria uh, may reside within the cell vacuoles, uh, for example, phagosomes. So there it has three options. Either it could remain there or migrate into the cytoplasm or from cytoplasm it could go into the adjacent cells through tunnels formed from actin. This is actually a very smart way uh, of spreading infection uh, from cell to cell and this allows bacteria to evade the host defenses. A very interesting bacteria called Listeria monocytogenes aggregates actin filaments uh, on its surface and is propelled in a slingshot fashion called actin rockets Okay, from one host to another and there are special proteins called YOPs um, which stand for Yersinia outer membrane proteins uh, Yersinia outer membrane proteins um, are produced by several uh, Yersinia species and they're example of virulence factor that acts 
after invasion of human cells, okay? And important effects of YOPs are to inhibit the phagocytosis and inhibit cytokine production by macrophages. And then there's another uh, important protein called YOPJ, uh, which is a protease. It's actually uh, responsible for inhibiting activation of host defenses. Uh, because since it's a protease, it cleaves the signal transduction proteins uh, required for induction of TNF synthesis. TNF is tumor necrosis factor. Two types of inflammation, uh, pyogenic and granulomatous. Neutrophils, predominating pyogenic. And macrophages plus T-cells, predominating granulomatous uh, inflammation. Uh, most of the gram-positive and negative cocci cause pyogenic inflammation. Uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, good example, causes granulomatous inflammation. Bacterial antigen leads to activation of cell-mediated immunity, and that leads to production of T-cells, sensitized T-cells, and macrophages, and their activity leads to cell death via phagocytosis. Cell death, by cell death I mean uh, bacterial cell death, bacterial death. Um, but sometimes these critters survive within the macrophage, and so these may form granuloma, and so they usually cause granulomatous lesions, uh, okay? And examples would be Mycobacterium, uh, Legionella, Brucella, uh, Listeria. Another important point to remember is that these uh, bacteria can be cultured on micro microbiological media in lab, and so therefore they're not uh, obligate intracellular, okay? Uh, that's just how you may differentiate obligate intracellular organisms from uh, organisms that are uh, you know good at surviving intracellularly three prime mechanism of actions for intracellular survival uh, are inhibition of phagosome infusion with lysosome inhibition of acidification of phagosome and escape from phagosome into the cytoplasm the third one by the way is a very effective way uh, of bacteria or pathogen to cause infection and this way the bacteria escapes the host defenses too. Uh, I've already mentioned that before so that was just a reiteration. Pathogenic genes are clustered in pathogenicity islands encoding virulence factors. Genes encoding adhesins, invasins and exotoxins are adjacent to each other on islands. Uh, pathogenicity islands can't replicate without bacterial chromosome unlike plasmids and bacteriophages. Pathogenicity islands are found commonly in many gram-positive uh, cocci and gram-negative rods. Exotoxins are produced by both gram-negative and gram-positive bugs. Uh, their polypeptides and their genes are located on plasmids or bacteriophages. Uh, they're more toxic than endotoxin and they're very good antigen and uh, they induce synthesis of uh, antibodies called antitoxins. Uh, treatment of exotoxin with formaldehyde or acid or heat converts it to toxoid which is used as a vaccine okay their structure is composed of a b subunits okay active for a binding for b and they act by adp ribosylation of target proteins and so they could either inactivate it or hyperactivate it alrighty so there are three MOAs or mechanism of actions um, and examples are um, given here uh, diphtheria, for example, ADP ribosylates elongation factor 2, which is going to inactivate the protein, and then that's going to lead to inhibition of protein synthesis. Cholera is going to ADP ribosylate GS protein, which is going to activate the target protein, leading to increased camp concentration, leading to watery diarrhea. Pertussis is going to ADP ribosylate GI, in, which is going to in inactivate the target protein, leading to increased CAMP concentration. CAMP, by the way, is cyclic uh, uh, AMP. And then that's going to lead to symptoms of whooping cough. Exotoxins are excreted through excretion systems, and excretion systems either release or throw exotoxins in extracellular space, or they can uh, inject them directly into cells. There are six types of excretion systems, type 3, injectosome being the most important, and this is mediated by needle-like projection, also known as molecular syringe, uh, and transport pumps in the bacterial cell membrane. Okay? Uh, examples would be Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Shigella salmonella, E. coli, and Yersinia pestis. Alright, so they all 
deploy type 3 secretion system. Lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin is an integral part of gram-negative bacteria's cell wall. It causes fever and septic shock. Beta-hydroxymeristic acid is always one of the fatty acids and is only found in lipid A. And this is a structure of endotoxin you see on the right side, composed of O-antigen, core polysaccharide, disaccharide, diphosphate, and fatty acids. These two things make up lipid A, which is the pathogenic part. So clinically, characteristics uh, of LPS uh, are fever, hypertension, disseminated intravascular coagulation, activation of alternate pathway of complement cascade, macrophage activation, and then systemic inflammatory response syndrome, uh, also known as SIRS, results from these symptoms. Its symptoms are fever, hypertension, tachycardia, tachypnea, and leukocytosis. Just remember these uh, symptoms and characteristics in, in case the clinical scenario comes in the exam. Oh, and by the way, septic shock is bacteria in blood, toxic shock is toxins in blood, and septic shock is mediated by IL-1, interleukin-1, and tumor necrosis factor, and continues to act even after bug is gone. So, remember that. And so remember that endothelial damage is going to cause DIC and hypotension. And because of the damage, plasma leaks out and that's going to lead to hypovolemia and that's going to cause hypotension. Damaged endothelium is a site of platelet aggregation and that's going to lead to IV clots formation and then that's going to form DIC. And to assess the presence of DIC, we have D-dimer lab test. Um, and then we have endotoxins effects. They are due to TNF and IL-1, and TNF is a central mediator. IV fluids are sterilized by filtration because that gets rid of the bacteria plus the endotoxins, so that'll solve our uh, clinical problem. And finally, the immunopathogenesis we've already mentioned, that it's the response, immune response to the bacteria that causes the symptoms. Examples are glomerular nephritis and rheumatic fever. These are autoimmune diseases, I think, I'm not sure. But let's look at the examples here. Antibody against M protein of strep pyogenes cross reacts with the joint, okay, heart and brain tissue. So the inflammation results in arthritis, carditis, and chorea. Stages of infectious disease. Haha. <laughs> okay, so incubation period is the period between acquisition and beginning of symptoms. Prodrome period is during non specific symptoms, and specific illness period is convalescence period during which illness uh, abates and then patient becomes healthy again. So, did isolated bacteria cause infection? Follow Cody's postulate and you'll know. So here goes Cody's postulate. Organism must be isolated from every patient with disease and should be free from all other organisms. Grown in pure culture in vitro, that's in petri dish, in lab, pure bug must cause disease. And then organism must be recovered from the inoculant animal as well. So how do we diagnose infectious diseases? Obviously we have signs and symptoms of illness, but then recovery of pathogen from appropriate specimen is usually enough for diagnosis. Uh, and of course, presence of normal flora elsewhere in the body would tell you. Uh, and then detecting a rise in antibody titer, uh, for example, titer in second or late serum sample should be at least four times the titer of antibody in first or uh, early sample okay and finally we're done we're done we're done thank you very much for listening and i hope this is gonna help you all in this test exam whatever the hell is coming uh, and good luck